So today, Mr. Brian Gocher is going to be joining us. He's a little bit late. Uh, he said he needed an extra five minutes. I sent him the link, and now I'm just waiting for him. Oh, he just read my message, so he he's probably going to be joining shortly. And uh, when that time comes, I will introduce him. And I'm very excited to talk with him. I've known this guy, well, since since C Doom. He helped me uh, master the tracks, really mentored me, and we've been friends ever since. Never lost a touch. Brian. There he is. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Crystal clear. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brian Gocher. Thump monk. Thump monks? Thump, thump monks? Uh, well, I'm the thump monk. But the thump monks are whoever, uh, whoever I'm working with. That's why the cool. title's plural. Awesome. Well, good morning. Good see morning to you. Your, see, you're still drinking your coffee as well. That's why I needed the extra five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to deliver you just incoherent rambling, so uh, uh-huh. I uh, I'm, I'm plugged in. I've got my, <clears throat> I call this my nuclear power plant cooling tower. Yeah, it has that of, the, that kind of nice little yeah, shape there. Full of coffee. It's so big. I don't always is it me? use that mug. Hmm? Does ever is it me or does every game you ever play <clears throat> have a point where you have to stop the reactor from melting down? I feel like not, Half-Life not did every it. game. I mean, I don't think Mario Brothers ever had the the. I don't remember the nuclear power plant reactor melting down in Super Mario Brothers. It might be slated though for the next. You know, <laughs> it might be that really, might be the to yeah. stop Bowser from overheating, you know. <laughs> it's going to blow. <laughs> Get him, jump man. That's a cool hat. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh it's just a regular regular beanie that I got from the mall, which by the way, if you've gone to the mall by yourself recently, there's no faster way to feel very old. Oh god, uh, yeah. Yeah, I got well, this at the Vans store, and then I got this on Etsy, the patch, for, get this, $6.66. Ugh. I, ter- I congratulate, terrible number, but apropos. <laughs> I congratulated the seller on, on the appropriate price. <laughs> All the other patches are totally different prices, and this was I'd, I'd, I'd have to I'd have to skip it on principle then. But <laughs> I, did, I, did have, I did have this mall experience talking about feeling old. I took my son to see the Batman there. He was meeting up with oh. one of his friends. So I just threw him at the movie and then I wandered the halls. Ooh. A bunch of teenagers came up to me. No lie. The first one says to me, hey, oh, Santa, what are we getting for Christmas? Oh. I didn't care. I mean, I, I told him that he was getting coal for bothering old people in malls. and But we worked <laughs> it out. He was nice after ju- that. and He's getting some you, Jordans now. So You could just say, I'm getting my steps in, man. Just leave me alone. I need my 10,000 steps. Leave me alone, Sonny. Yeah. You know. I was I was killing demons at a moon base or at a, you know at a at a Mars base when you were you know a twinkle in your parents' eye. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> uh oh, did you freeze? I think I think Brian froze. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Sorry you were just that. suddenly Our... froze. You were like, Our... <laughs> that's me. I wouldn't get frozen in a handsome face. They'd be like, uh, yeah, no, it wasn't that bad, but it was kind of funny. Cause it I suddenly stay realized now. Right there. Yeah. This, uh, this happens almost like every other morning when I've forgotten to put our, we have a tower garden that grows vertically mm-hmm. like, uh, and it, it just turns on and I haven't put it on a different, uh, breaker leg. So I'm going to have to do that. So speaking of towers, where you live in New York, right? No. I no, grew up in I, New York City. You grew up in New York City. Okay. Grew up Where in New York City. Now? Grew up in Minute. I live in <clears throat> New Jersey, dead center of New Jersey. Okay. New, North Brunswick. Okay. Yeah, so tell me about growing up in New York. The, the um, 45 second recap. It was the 70s and the 80s. Uh, things were a lot more loose, but um, it's turning into it again, which, um, you know. <laughs> kind of crazy there hmm. uh son of a single mom went to public school uh took my lumps <laughs> learned how to play <laughs> in a hardcore band 
in a punk nice. band. Uh, had a guitar teacher who would show me all kinds of music. And uh, <clears throat> so I went to music school briefly, had enough of that, came back, worked for, believe it or not, neoclassical composer Philip Glass mm. for a few years at his studio. Um, and, you know, was in a band, did a lot of other things there. Um, and then, you know, truth be told, I, I, I got into, I got into the Bible, which moved me to New Jersey. And that's why I live here now. Cause I, I'm, I'm part of a, a fellowship that, that does something here. But that's cool, man. New York was about 21 years and now I'm cool. I've lived here in New Jersey longer. So if you ask me where I'm from, like people, oh, yeah. where are you from? I, I often just, I'm from Jersey cause yeah, you know, I totally get I love that. New Jersey. Yeah. Where like are I, you? I, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, yeah. So is it is it still fair to call people from Wisconsin cheeseheads? Like, is that cool, or, or do they always, get mad and roll their eyes? It's always fair. No, we we put cheese in everything, so it's I totally love cool. cheese. Oh yeah, I love cheese. Yeah, we just made a two nights ago or three nights ago. We made a mashed cauliflower dish, mm. and, you know, and it just I put shredded cheddar cheese in it and it was so good we tore through it and we had to make it again like as soon as it was gone <laughs> such grown-up food oh yeah god yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah we don't do the frozen foods anymore <laughs> all right man mm. well i i'm gonna well first i should say it's really awesome to finally talk with you we've known each other likewise since, man like seriously the middle 2000s <clears throat> uh how many conversations do you, I mean, we, we've talked, I've listened to your music. I mean, your, your expertise in metal is like, it's phenomenal. Like just watching where, you know, where we both were when we started and then just yeah. hearing the progression of your, uh, it's, it's everything too. Cause like when you, when you grew as you've grown, it's not just your, your melodic and, and your arrangement skills. It's the mixing. It's the idea of how to produce it. Like I've, I've seen you actually like layer on over the years and and i mean you've got a lot more views on on youtube than than i do so yeah yeah I, I, thanks my youtube channel i've sort of let flounder by the wayside like i've had my channel for uh 16 years this may which wow. is crazy to think about and i have 1800 subscribers so i'm not exactly uh <laughs> rolling in it well still you've had a an increase in uh in listenership, if I remember. Oh, recently. yeah. The, so. the Spotify side is just going Spotify. nuts. I, yeah. I don't know if you're on Spotify, if you look at the analytics on Spotify for your artist page, but you, you can uh, do see. Do I have an like, artist page on there? I have no idea. I think I've looked you up. I don't I, I know I, I I'm going to release an album, and I know I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing an album soon, um, and I'm going to be putting it on there. I already paid for it, like, you know, whatever the release. I just. I haven't gotten to finishing all mastering all the mixes. It's it's all ambient stuff, okay. and it's from the a lot of it is from the work I've done with uh, Matt Skutnik for the Submachine Games and for his recent one Slice of Sea. So uh, I will have a Spotify page, but you you clearly are ranking up there already. I don't understand. Like just uh, I have screenshots from last year where I was like, oh my god, I've got two thousand monthly listeners. <laughs> and I mean that was big, and I appreciate every single one of those streamers, every single one of them. That's awesome. And, and you deserve for, it. For some reason, I'm at fourteen thousand now. It's wild. Thirty thousand streams a month. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, What's that like? Seven seven dollars and thirty eight cents a month. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm actually kind of looking forward to the thing with Spotify is their their uh, pay, uh, payouts are always really far behind mm. um like i oh so like two years from now you'll <laughs> no it's like usually like three months uh mm. so i like if i get a, i'll get I, I usually get a monthly payout from cd baby who's and then like spotify ha is one of those spotify right. is usually like 30 dollars, and then all <laughs> the other ones are like 10 cents a dollar yeah. you know spotify <laughs> is far and away the biggest payout uh, so when I was at around like 5,000 monthly listeners, it, I was getting like $30, roughly $30 a month in payouts right. from Spotify. Uh, produce, so eventually that's of, your, that's your produce bill. Like, you know, yeah. when you're shopping. 
Right. Well, it was really strange when suddenly I realized that the money I'm getting from my streaming revenue is actually part of my monthly income. Like it's not it's not huge. Not right. huge. But you know, it's enough to pay for I don't know. Some habit somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah. But yeah. ASCAP, um, um when I get my ASCAP check, I think it's um it's typically because I mean that uh, the music work that I do now isn't really involving streaming so much. It's I do trailers and yeah. I've done a lot of uh, a lot of things that wind up you know winding up in TV spots and things like that. Yeah. So, but ASCAP is like three quarters behind or something like that. Oh. So oh you my know, God. <clears throat> and I'm sure that they'll just say, well, because of COVID, it's now going to be ten years behind. I'm like, okay. <laughs> is what it is and you know and ASCAP can vary wildly depending on you know half the time I don't know where a song has gone until three quarters mm. later and then I find out that you oh know I remember God. once um, this track we did um, I worked with Methodic Doubt Music uh, called Half the Man and it, it was in an X-Men trailer and, it, and then it started getting placements all over the place but the biggest check I got from ASCAP was because a little part of that song had been playing on CBS in a promo for get this, The Price Is Right, like repeatedly. <laughs> it was like hundreds of times that they they used it, and I'm like, wow. this thing has Magneto like struggling over it in one instance, and then it has The Price Is Right actually bringing in the books. Exactly. So, you know, that's but funny. It's, it's so far behind. Um, and it's always been yeah. that way. It's, I mean, they, they take all this time and to, to figure out where your music has been used. So I guess that's good. But given yeah, the choice, in instance, go with BMI in your instance, it's, a, it's more complicated. With The funny thing with streaming services, <clears throat> it's instant. They could literally know right now yeah. all the places. Like, there's no yeah. reason for it to take so long. But anyway, um, I was going to just circle back to what you were saying about my mastery with metal. Uh <laughs> And, like, the progression that you've seen me go through. Um, and I just have to give you credit for a large portion of my mixing and mastering skills because <clears throat> you've been you've been the biggest mentor for me uh, through oh, these years. Stop. Not YouTube? Come on. No, that's well, my okay. mentor. <laughs> some, some, some of it, yeah. Like, there's a guy, uh, huge for it. Creative Sauce. He's got a YouTube channel, and he, he does Cakewalk exclusively. And oh, are that, you are you on pretty, Cakewalk? Yeah, still on is Cakewalk. It called, is Cakewalk? Did they get bought by Fruity Loops? No, or not Fruity Loops. Loops. Band Fruit. Lab bought them. So yeah, that was a bit of a fiasco. You know, for years I was paying for Cakewalk. Every time they came out with a new version, I'd pay three, four hundred dollars or whatever the price was for an upgrade. If you were getting in new, it would be seven hundred dollars or whatever it was. Right. And uh, Gibson bought them. Because Gibson was mm. trying to expand, because everyone needs to expand <clears throat> or they die, right? And uh, they kind of overextended themselves. And Gibson Guitars almost went out of business, which is oh, I know. Nuts. So well, it was the Department of Justice that went after them for yeah having for, like wood or something like maple that. Maple or like uh, what the hell? I can't remember. What, it was imported wood for their fretboards. So it all yeah, had to do with with who they were donating to. That's what always is oh, the case. Absolutely, you know, but, it's ridiculous. So. Um, but yeah, so Cakewalk actually died. It was scary, and it was right after I paid a, a hefty fee to have lifetime upgrades for free. And they were oh, saying, man. "Like this is this is the last time you ever have to pay, and all so your you life settled in." Yeah, you were I was like, like, "Okay, I'm gonna good." Live Cakewalk yep. forever. And yeah, and and no. then. And then they just announced they not they announced like Cakewalk is dead, I'm like oh my god! And for a few months, no one knew what was going to happen. I was like, well, what, what the hell am I going to find now? I think I vaguely I, remember this. Yeah. So so then Band Lab announced that they bought the IP, and and it was all it was never called Cakewalk. The software itself was never Cakewalk. It was, it was always the company like, called Cakewalk, right? Yeah, the company was called Cakewalk, and it was like Pro Audio. The first version that I had was Pro Audio Eight in nineteen ninety eight, and uh, then it was like Sonar, Sonar Studio, Sonar XL, like all these. Sonar, different, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I remember and that. The one that I was using before the collapse was <coughs> Sonar, Sonar Platinum. You know, because I need I need to have all the bells and whistles. Yeah, 
But then, yeah, no one knew, like, well, what's their pricing model going to be? Everyone just paid for this lifetime upgrade. And then finally they announced it's free. And then we're all, we were all like, wait a second. <laughs> We've been paying for years, and now it's free Does this have everyone? in-app purchases? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, it, it is a little lacking. Like, I've watched videos on other DAWs, and they just come with everything you need. Like, fancy EQs, fancy compressors... Cakewalk, in my opinion, is a little bit more like Windows. It comes with the basics. Right. And then you have to go buy the VSTs that you want. You have to buy yeah. a fancy EQ or whatever. No, that's absolutely true. I think, um, I think, I mean, I, I always think of it this way. I'm not, I'm married to a woman. I'm not married to a doll, you know? Yeah. And so if I needed to, I did actually, I, I've gone through several DAWs. Mm -hmm. Um, I started, this is, this is how old I am. Okay. I started on an Atari 520 ST that 520 stands for how much Ram it had 520 K K. Yeah. K. And, um, it, I, there was a program by, uh, Dr. T called real time. I moved from that to Cubase and I moved up to a 1040 ST E. So that had like a whole megabyte of Ram. And I, I gotta say the timing on that SC with Cubase was phenomenal, but you had to put this giant dongle, like plug it into the side. It was hanging off. It was like a hazard. You know, <laughs> you couldn't put your drink on it or anything like that. And then I finally got a Mac and I made my way into logic mm. and I loved logic and, and, and I, I was ready to propose. I was down on one knee and then out of the corner of my eye, I saw Ableton live mm. and I was like, can you hold on a minute logic? I just have to talk to this other dog over feet. here for a second. As yeah. I got cold feet and then, and then, you know, it was really hard as being in a relationship with both of them. So after a while, I just made my bed with Ableton and, uh, but if something better comes along, you know, I just don't know if it will. And even though Ableton definitely comes like if, if, if just given vanilla Ableton and a laptop, I can make a track, you know, Yeah. but I still have like a half, I have like an Elon Musk amount of money invested in third party plugins oh, right yeah. now. I mean, we all, we all do. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I'm mean, so that I, I would say that I, I would I, I I like its workflow. Okay. You know, it isn't lacking in workflow because it well you can pick a workflow. That's the what I didn't have with Logic. Logic kind of dictated a linear workflow that you had to do it this way. And Ableton was sort of just like I mean I don't care how you want to work and you know and it would you could you could work in either of these two different arrangement views. You could use clips. You could make a song in different ways. You could get one of those little. Um, <clears throat> trigger pads and, and have fun with one of those. And I've done all of that. And, you know, and I, I found a way I like working with it. So, you know, but I think the song that I did for, for, uh, not to jump into the topic too quickly, but, uh, for, for our work, I did in logic and I, okay. I couldn't even open it now if I wanted to, cause I don't have yeah. logic anymore. Yeah. Oh my God. It, there's just no way to resurrect an old song. Like if you, no. And, and you should never switch computers mid mid project. Like, just never. finish what you're doing, mix it down, and then you got to say goodbye to it because there's no way you're yeah. gonna open it later. Nope. Unless you print stems, yeah, right. you are giving up some control. Or yep. if you're really crazy and you print tracks, like actual track for track, then you could do something with it. But, and I kind of wish I had <clears throat> with EM uh, with uh, E1 M9 because yeah. I didn't even, I mean, I had made a lot of rock before, but my vision for how I wanted it to sound, I'll just say that was essentially Mick Gordon and he has realized what yeah. I totally couldn't yeah, right. back then. When I listened to his stuff, I just, oh my God. I partly get like depressed and super excited at the same time. I'm like someone did it. Yeah. I feel the same way, man. When I listened to that Doom 2016 soundtrack, <clears throat> the mastery over it. Yeah. Every aspect. Oh my god. Yeah. And, did you, and you've seen the live performance, right? Like the where yeah. where it's just this it's like this kind of nice sort of nerdy guy like leaping around the stage with a nine string guitar. Nine string guitar. Smashing just jigga -da -jigga -da -jigga -da. and I'm like this is this is what video games brought us to because back in the day you had to look like Death Clock. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you watch Metalocalypse, but you know, you needed like a scary looking, you know, metal band right. the guy with a lot of hair. And now, now it's a guy who looks like a gamer. Yeah, you know, he looks absolutely like you know, in between like really intense levels, he's he's got to use his uh, 
inhaler and you know and and, and he probably had a retainer and he's like mostly a genius and probably has you know great investment portfolio and then he's rocking harder than any of those long hair monsters did you know he's just destroying it and I don't know. I mean, my my admiration level for that guy never never stops going. Although I hear he won't work with ID anymore yeah. because they uh, they remastered they some of his tracks. You know, <clears throat> whatever. I didn't I didn't they follow the up. breakup. It's, it's always he said, Ed said. You were you eyes on Kanye and 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 Kim, right? Oh, always. All the, always. Whatever those celebrities are doing is just whew, top of I my know. mind. But yeah, I watched it. <laughs> Did you ever watch? Um, he gave a speech on how he uh, made the soundtrack and how he came up with the sounds. Did you ever watch no. that? Oh, oh no. my well, God. I did watch. I watched the thing about how he, he looked at things in the game that were electric. And so he thought that the music should be, it should definitely come from analog electric circuitry. And he showed his, a little bit of his rig, which mm-hmm. was like, that was, I was looking, I was intently looking at everything. Only to find out that he has actually all of his gear advertised on that that gear site that that shows you everything he makes, and I did watch that part. But um, I think he was being interviewed by Warren Hewitt, and that's no, this was almost this was practically like a TED talk for musicians. It was oh, it was like a master class. It was I'll have to find that link and send it to you. But you know he when it, they like they didn't id software initially said they didn't want guitars. They didn't want it to sound like. They wanted it to sound like nothing that no one had ever heard. Something, yeah, like coffee coming into a cup. Pouring right, into yeah, a cup. there's 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 my soundtrack for the morning. But the 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 moment that he finally figured out, okay, I, I think I'm getting to the sound they're looking for, is mm-hmm. he made this signal chain with parallel tr- parallel chains, and one of those chains just blew me away. He had this little. Uh, like a one watt amplifier, you know, like those little pretend Marshall so overloads but, instantly. But the, yeah, he overloaded the thing, put a microphone in front of it, and fed it back through the signal chain. So when he played the note, he just he just put a, a sine wave through this through this chain. When he played right. the note, it squelched the feedback. But as soon as the note went <sighs> away, it fed back beautifully into. Oh my god! When he played that note. The crowd just cheered. That's awesome. Yeah, and those it was filled <clears> with people <throat> who didn't know anything about music. Like, and I'm sitting here drooling. Like, oh my god, I can't believe he just did that. I mean, but isn't that today? Like, you've got so many young people on YouTube that are constantly telling you how they did it. it used to be that we kept all our secrets. Like that was <laughs> yeah. I, like I mean, musical magicians, pro- right? Producers who would be like, "I'm not telling you what kit I used," or "I'm not," and like. I, I I was never like that. I'll say straight up. Like I was like, oh, come in and see all of my secrets, because I've always believed <clears throat> that even if you took, if I took all of your gear, I couldn't do what you do because mm-hmm. it's kind of molded around you. Like I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't make the same thing. I'd make what comes from me. So I don't. Th- I think it's always going to be the composer that makes it, and not yeah. not not saying that the gear doesn't count, but. I wouldn't make the same thing, and, and neither would neither would you know we if we had Mick Gordon studio would make some pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, but it would not sound like him. It would sound, and so you have all these young people sharing this stuff on YouTube, and people are learning um, about things that are far outside their circle of, of interest because of podcasting. And so here he's explaining how he got a sound that, while they may not be musicians, they've heard it a million times while they were shooting a Hell Night or something like that. And when they hear it and they see all the work that went into making just that one cool sound, you kind of want to give the guy a great big round of applause. I can totally see it because yeah. you satisfied me over and over again while I've been shooting and killing and doing all these other things that are fine in a video game. You know, you, you gave me this emo- – because music is a, it provides an emotional response. It invokes emo- an emotional response. And that game soundtrack absolutely – I'd say here's – to get on, I'll get off my stump speech for one second, but the big difference between the new Doom games and the old ones is you feel in those old ones like you're running away from stuff. Hmm. And in the new ones, you get to the place where you feel like stuff's running from you. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Like, yeah. I've always thought, like, 
let's get to the place where it's not just like like I I, I like feeling dangerous in these games. That's kind of yep. why you know because you know later today I'm going to be looking at my 401k or doing something really not dangerous or you <laughs> right. know just very just you know plain and suburban. So when I'm in that game and I'm I'm bringing the forces of hell to heal. I, that's what feels good about those, and the soundtrack absolutely fits that. Like you feel as dangerous as that music. Yeah. So I imagine those people, their response had something to do with that. You know, yeah. the emotional response that they had from the game. You know, yeah. Yeah. I've, blah, I've blah. actually I'm a I've talked quite a bit. I've actually talked quite a bit about that exact thing with some of the other guys. Where my only knock against Doom Three is you didn't you, like you felt like a weakling. Like you're constantly oh, yeah. running, you're you're running backwards away from monsters because if they get too close, they're gonna smack your head back. And uh, yeah, yeah, Doom 2016 is more like you charge forward and you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be a badass and open up a can. You're the terror. Yeah. Oh yep. yeah. You're the yeah, terror. You 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 know. I think when I was playing Doom in the 90s, and uh, you know, I remember I had Doom dreams, and I remember telling like I, I lived oh, with yeah. like, three other guys, like we had a house, and. um I was like, I had a doom dream last night. And one of them was like, oh, my God, that must have been a nightmare. I was like, no, things were things were running away from me. I was hiding under a table waiting for them because I'd gotten so good at the game that in the context of my dream, <clears throat> you know, I was I might as well have just hit ID KFA. Like I was going to, you yeah. know, I was killing stuff all the time. And that's what these these games feel like to me now. You know, like you're I, it. Don't get me wrong. They're hard. I haven't even made it through Doom Eternal, you know, <clears throat> but I liked that, too. I thought I think that they're very, very different games. Doom Eternal feels like a co- like a comic book. Like I didn't play it. Level. It's don't get me wrong. It's it's a lot of fun, but the Doom twenty sixteen I felt was the most playable. Cool. You know, I've only played. I had to get a PC to do that. Oh, wow, that's that's dedication. I've got the PS four back here, and so mm-hmm. I I got the game used at one of the local used. Uh, buy it again places and yeah. i've only i've i got it i think 2019 i may have played four I, hours i played it this year this is my first time oh, playing okay. it the no, thing I is feel so bad. i i built the pc as a new music rig because my mac is beyond upgrade and apple is now charging far too much for pro gear so i thought well i'll give it a shot you know uh, i know somebody personally who worked for microsoft and he said that for Windows 10, they really worked on the audio drivers to stop having so many issues, uh, you know, like what they previously had. Mm-hmm. So, and I found that that's true. Like I can operate on it seamlessly without, you know, hardly the same, really, really almost no difference uh, mm-hmm. in terms of performance. You know, a couple of things are different here and there in terms of workflow, but otherwise it's the same thing. Well, welcome. Welcome to the PC world. Thank you. Thank I've you. been here. I've been, been here before here when I worked a desk job, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> anyway, uh, that was that was a fun conversation. Um, <laughs> Twenty five minutes in, we should probably talk about what we came here to talk about. I don't know what we came here to talk about. Me I neither. just said yes I've, to the interview, so yeah. <laughs> it's, your, it's your show. One so, line to another. <clears throat> Welcome to the Sonic Clang Podcast. Funny thing <laughs> is, now that I've got this. This sweet setup, I've thought I've thought a few times, like, man, I could actually do a podcast. That would be pretty cool. You totally could. Here, let's let's put some green in the background since it's we're gonna move to the next part of the interview. There we go. Let's do a Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a flump. We are now talking about <coughs> Classic Doom Three. And I'll just play this for a few seconds as I look at the questions. So Got it. All right, so I'm going to turn that down. Sorry. So No problem. Um, why don't you uh, tell everyone, um, if you feel you can or want to, uh, your, your real name, screen name, <clears throat> anything about uh, your screen name that you want to tell? My name is yourself. Brian Gosher. You will never meet anybody else with that name because very few people are named Gosher. Um, my screen name, my music name is Thump Monk. <clears throat> my band is The Thump Monks, but that's just because I work with usually different people for different projects. So that person that I'm working with becomes an honorary Thump Monk, <clears throat> but I didn't want to disclude them from the name. I like to share. Um, <clears throat> and the name, give me one second here. I'm dying of allergies. 
The name comes from watching billions and zillions of hours of kung fu flicks and uh, probably working on dance music with that thump, thump, you know, or, or hip hop yeah. or something like that. I've, I've done a lot of work with different people, and so I glued them together as common interests. There you have the Thump Monks. But I also use it as my screen name if I if I join any game or do anything like that, just because I don't want to have to think of another one. Have you ever had anyone online say, hey, aren't you the guy that did E1M1 on Classic Doom 3? Or E1M9? F- E1M9, yeah. I have seen uh, comments on YouTube. Yes, people have um, used it for different things, things that have gotten taken down. Um, and yes, I've had... it's it's. I, I'm not really that great at navigating YouTube's comment section, and I don't really think YouTube's very well built for for social interaction. Yeah, uh, some of the threads get long, but for the most part, I think people just watch videos. But I have seen some people say, you know, hey, this 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 is really good, or uh, I've seen quite a few people uh, think that um, I was you, which is fine by me because good company. <laughs> um, so I don't usually bother to correct any records because I also just. I never want to be that guy who's like, it's pronounced kosher. Like, I'm, that's not me. I never so, knew that. Um, but if someone takes credit away from you, I would I would absolutely jump in and, and say something. But uh, I've even seen it used. Someone, cl- I don't know, you probably saw this. Someone clipped together the first person sequence from the Doom movie with The Rock using EM19. And it worked. I will say it It, it, it kind of worked. It was sort of cool. That's pretty cool. No, I haven't seen that. They took it down because of the copyright infringement on the on the footage from the film. But it was up there yeah. for a while. And, and uh, yeah, so some people have said that. I get a lot of people talking to me more about the submachine games that I've worked on because there's 10 years of those. And they're sure. all free games. So, But nice. every now and then. And I, I try to give credit always to you and to Bobby Prince, who mm-hmm. wrote all those original. Do- you know what he was hearing in his head yeah, when you listen right. to that dinky midi. Sound that you know, do 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 do. You know, in his head, he was hearing what we tried to make. You know, yeah, yeah. I but, exactly. Uh, I actually feel like uh, when we were working on that music, we were just trying to realize the vision that he initially had yeah. ten years before. E one M one, you 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 creamed it. You smashed it. You know, like that. I, I had always, and I've heard other people try to cover it. But we're all amateurs, yeah. you know, at the time, like doing that, right. that kind of thing. And when it screams in, I was like, this is, the, I, I wanted to jump on that project because I actually nice. wasn't very happy with that version of Doom. Oh. And I was like, if someone's going to remake the Doom levels, I felt like they owed that to us, that there should have been bonus levels that were just at least the first episode, knee deep in the dead or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And so, but it, I actually think it's much cooler and very id software to let let that be crowdsourced, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, so good job there, Brian. Well, thank you. Um, and yeah, when when uh, when I was working on E1M1, um, and and of course I still have to get interviewed. I, I'm going to have Gaz interview, interview me. <laughs> uh, but when when I was working on it, I I started it like like the the nor- the song would normally start and i just felt like the beginning needed a punch and and right. i really i like fiddled around for a while and ultimately just came up with the the harmonics with the whammy bar yeah to start it out and i always like to say sometimes when i when i do that on a song it's like a punch to the face like that song starts like a punch to the face and that for it doom should. it it needed that. Yeah. But I, God, know that, I, I know that. I, oh, go ahead. Go, John Romero's heard it. He's my, heard my our version? music. Oh. oh. The whole thing. I uh, he, he used to make himself available on Apple Chat. Like, he's just there. And I would just sometimes say, hey. You know, and he'd be like, hi. Um, which I've always thought was pretty cool of him. And yeah. um, I threw him E1M9. And he had told me that he's heard lots of people do lots of things. He thought our stuff was really good. Wow. You That's know, cool. And if I didn't he was know just that. being nice. I'll still take it because you know sure. he's. I remember him in an interview saying, "And this is why E one M one is so important. Why the track you did is so important is because of the way the game starts." He says he hates game tutorials, hmm. and what he mm-hmm. loved about Doom was it was like, "Here's a gun. 
<laughs> That's it. Like you figure yeah. the rest out as you go. Yeah. And the music doesn't give you time to sit there and try to read anything or think of anything. It's like you're here now and there's metal playing. Go. You know, and I think <laughs> yes. that's why a punch in the face is key, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But go ahead. I, gonna, I'm, I, I won't interrupt. Well, I think I was going to say when I first played the game uh, and the first time I heard that music, it just hit me that this is no remorse for Metallica. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, there's... A bunch of inspirations. I'm not going to get right. into whether it's this song or this song. I don't care. For me, it spoke to me that it's no remorse from Kill 'Em All. And I was the biggest Metallica fan at the time. I mean, right there's a reason I'm good at metal. Because I learned and grew up playing Metallica. And when when I heard that song, when the game started... It was like nothing I had ever heard. Like I had played Nintendo, Super Nintendo. Here I was in 3D, shooting things, and there's yep. no metal music playing. Yep. So, so what I made for E1M1 is what I heard, right, in my head when I heard that song initially. Yeah, yeah. There's something I, about that too. That the fact that he he did such a good job with the MIDI that even though it didn't sound like it, we all knew where he was going. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty seen, sure I even I've got seen. my brother and I was like, Paul, get in here. You gotta hear this. Some of this. <laughs> it sounds like Metallica. Yeah, it's no more do 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 which by the way is that the Mario music is an incredible. I I have heard it so many times and on a I've analyzed it as much as I can on a, a melodic level and it is an incredible piece of music. Like Oh yeah. To have something that you can hear over and over again and not lose your mind, you know, over. But that's also definitely I've been looking for a Doom track, and I forget. It's from Doom 2, and I wasn't mm. able to find it, but mostly just because I think I got impatient uh, listening for it on YouTube. But it's it kind of has like a Latin vibe, which I always mm. thought was hilarious that they mm-hmm. threw. And there's some Hell on Earth track in there that's got like a do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. <laughs> and, and I'm like, this game is so esoteric in its own, in its, yeah. in its own way. Like, it has a huge sense of humor really when you when you think about it the the horrible idea that hell has come to earth or that you're at a mars base and then you know there's sometimes some funny music obviously a lot mm-hmm. of the music is good to lurk to and destroy but i've, I've always i've always enjoyed this sort of unapologetic of that whole franchise you know yeah <clears throat> yeah i <clears throat> i probably shouldn't say anything bad about the music from doom but uh we'll go ahead then the my only the only reason I wouldn't want to do more so people have asked me hey can you redo this song from Doom 2 or this song from uh, this episode or whatever and the only reason that doesn't intrigue me is because at the core almost every one of those songs follows the same formula mm-hmm. and that formula it's like a one, four, is five. The, it's in, yeah it's like the 12 bar blues right Every it's a one four one five. Of it it starts on it starts on the <clears throat> one chord. Piano. It moves to the to the four chord. Then it goes back. Then it goes yep. to the five chord. But um, well, I would still entertain the idea of doing it, but I would reimagine it. And I think yes. so many times when someone's asking you to do it, they'd really like you to stick to the format. And I'm like, it's very hard for me if you're not paying me to stick to the format. <laughs> yes. So if, oh, if, if, I, <clears throat> if I'm doing it for free, I'm going to have some fun with this, and that's how it's going to go. Yeah, and you that's know. what you did with, with the one that you made. So let me get back to the questions because uh, we're jumping all over the place, which is fine. But I want to—I definitely want to ask some of these. Um, you kind of already mentioned some of these. Okay, so uh, in the Sea Doom team, what – and this isn't for me because I obviously know. Tell the people, what was your primary role on the team? I came in late. Uh, you let me in when you guys were more than three quarters of the way done with this thing, I think. So my job was first to get on the boards and figure out where I fit. I fit on in, in two or three places. One was to make E1M9 because you were like, I have enough stuff to do. And can you, can you take this one off my hands? So I did that. Uh, another one was to do the music for one of the animatic sequences. One or two of them. I, I forget if it's one or if it's two. Um, which I was really getting into at the time. I was starting to work to picture and to do stuff. So I was really excited about that. 
And I think the third third thing was to really sometimes I had to I had to get on the boards and talk about how the game you know I was playing different different versions of the of the of the game you know because it was in development and uh, you know is this gun proper is this you know how does this level feel are you experiencing any bugs basic just tester stuff uh, and I jumped in on that and I was telling you before that I jumped in at one point and I was like yeah I think the chain gun feels a little slow like it doesn't have the the FP you know the, the firing rate that the old one has and it like I don't even remember who it was with, but it ignited a, a firestorm of comments from one person who felt that the chain gun was perfect in every way. And um, and then a few other people, I think I, I made people brave to say, yeah, I think the chain gun could, could shoot a little more than it does. doesn't feel like the original game. Uh, but other than that, it was a lot of beta testing stuff. And then, and then I think you and I talked a lot about mastering because up to this point yeah. you hadn't done it. And I think you brought it up to me and said, well, what are you using? And so we had a conversation about limiters, compressors, uh, final EQs, how to get a code of shellac that's consistent across the whole thing. And I think that was probably the most of what I did was you and I going back and forth over the mastering. Yeah. I, I remember that a lot. And cause, uh, um, before you came in, like I had never recorded live drums Mm. I mean, I had no. I, I take that I back. That. I did for a, for a band uh, demo that I made in 1998. That's why I got Cakewalk. Um, right. But the drums were the drums were so harsh. Like when I was doing the classic Doom Three stuff, and I was trying to use really nice mics, but I didn't know the first thing about compressors and limiters. Like I was so green. You were in cymbal hell. Oh yeah, every I time the cymbal hit, it's it's it's. I made the same mistakes. I had the, the the privilege to learn in Philip Glass's studio from a couple of really great engineers, uh, a guy named Rob Eaton, did Eric Clapton, and uh, this guy Josh Abbey, who was like, he was the best. He he had, he was a guy who came from the power. The uh, I think it was the uh, it was big New York studio. Bob Dylan, all these guys. He was an intern then, and he a tough guy. Smoked larks, cursed at me. Didn't didn't like me. Kind of like the Dread Pirate Roberts, and showed me how to mic a drum kit. So I shared some of that information with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I know at some point when I was talking about compression for the overheads, moving them away, getting PZM mics, if you could find them up. Like, I'm starting to remember our conversations now, now that you said this stuff, because it's the same advice that I would give for anything. But, yeah. um, you know, you, I, the fact that you were using it, I remember being super impressed. I was like, this guy is actually playing the drums. I would have programmed him, which I did for EM19. Yeah, right. Because I don't have a drum kit and I can't play drums anyway. And I'm like, no, he's like Stevie Wonder in there. He's going to do every instrument on this thing if it kills him. Yeah. And so I do remember that. I was like, wow, dedication. There's a reason it took so long. If I were to do the soundtrack now, I would program my drums. And I, right. would, lay, I would lay the drums down in one session for each song. And then right. put the guitar. It would go so fast. Um <laughs> But I didn't have a good sample program back then. Addictive at only. Drums. I don't even think addictive drums. I don't know if you use addictive or Stephen no. Slate or what you use. Stephen Slate. That's yeah. That stuff wasn't exist. out yet. No, I had just started using addictive somewhere after the project. I used some drums in Logic, which were for E1M9, but like real drums, even when you get a crappy sound, if you compress the hell out of it and do some trickery here and there, they'll pass once the guitars are screaming over it. You know. Yeah, right. But yeah, it, it would be a totally different project now. It would like yeah. I spent nine months working on the songs, and I, I, if an I album. had the if I had the time, and I didn't have kids and responsibilities like back then, it would be so fast. Did you have kids back then? Nope. I think no, I. I what's my what? What year did we do it? 2000 you were you were involved in 2005 all right so yeah i had, I had a baby i had okay. a little two-year-old yeah and, and i my wife at the time who's no longer my wife she and, and yes see doom played a part in that oh, uh, i'm sorry to hear that <laughs> it's okay it no good marriage ever ended in divorce um <laughs> she she was actually working <laughs> nights so I was oh. working during the day. I would get home. I, think I remember you said that. And she would go off to the coffee shop and work until 9 p.m. So I just had all evening to just work on music. Jigga, 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 right? Oh, it was yeah. so cool. Chunk away. 
But anyway, um, yeah, we're going to have a lot of these little tangents and these side side things. This is going to be a great interview. I think that's the stuff that's interesting on a podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. All right, let me look at my next question. So, so you already said it was kind of like three quarters of the way through. Um, mm-hmm. I think if I remember, you probably worked like three months ish. Yeah, I, I came. It's easy for me what I did. I, I sailed in after you guys had, had done all the keel hull. You know, I, I just I just came in and you know. Now I know what I want to ask you put because some I never. On the table. I don't think I ever asked. And you kind of touched this, touched upon this in in our opening conversation, but mm-hmm. um, how did you stumble upon our project? How did you approach me? Because I just remember you were there, and I listened to some of your stuff, and I was like, "Oh my god, I am not worthy. This guy is incredible, and he wants to help me." So how how did <clears> that <throat> how did that ball get rolling? One, that's ridiculous. Two, um, I have made a habit of using the internet for what it's good for. And it's not good for much, in my opinion, because I'm getting older and I'm like, it's mostly just silly. But what it is great for is if you want to find somebody that's doing something you want to be a part of, you can pretty much pierce straight through to them. So what I had already done by the time... um, I reached out to you is I had already worked on a submachine game. Submachine came out on Newgrounds. Remember Newgrounds? Nope. The, it was it was all flash games and it was huge, like oh. billions of zillions of plays, lots of people on it. I played a game on there I liked and it had an ambient soundtrack, so I reached out to Matus Skutnik and I was like, Can I do your music for your next game? And he was like, Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. So that formula had worked for me. So I, 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 I'm eagerly anticipating Doom coming out. Meanwhile, Half Life Two is also in the works, yeah. and I'm I'm involved in talking to people on boards, and they're saying Half Life's going to blow it away. They're taking too long with Doom. I'm following all this stuff, and I keep looking for somebody who wants to do the original levels. I actively oh, okay. sought it because wow. I was frustrated by that game. I thought that game had an incredible engine, and a, and it had a decent. Now a few playthroughs through now, which I am, I probably played it like five times. It's a it's a it's a well crafted game. They really put a ton of work into it. I think I just got sick of like one imp in front and suddenly one behind. I was like, this one trick pony garbage has got to go. Right. So I I stumble across somehow, you guys after enough searches on some board, this Sea Doom project, and I was like, that'll do. That's fine, even if it stinks. You know, I didn't know anything about you guys yet. I was like, someone who wants to make the first level would be enough for me to jump in and say, do you need a gun sound? Do you need anything? So I threw myself at you on a board, I think. I reached out. That's how I found you. I was already looking for someone to redo, redo those first levels because cool. that was the, the major disappointment to me was that they didn't do it. It didn't make it. And I was like, nobody would be more qualified to do it than you guys. But like I said, now in retrospect, pretty cool that it was fan fan driven because there's no company other than id that can take the credit for letting fans take control of the game you know from remember those doom wads people just figured out how to start making them and then they released the source engine and so that was that's the company that said you know what go for it do it do what you're going to do with it and uh so i would say it's the id culture that led me to you because i knew someone would do it cool <clears throat> and actually, I, I didn't remember could have made that a short answer. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that's a perfect answer because after seventeen, eighteen years, however long it's been that, that we've known each other, I've, I've never asked how, how how like how the hell did you find me? I was that, looking for you, Brian. You were looking for me. You saw me. I looked. Yeah, exactly. You saw me I in a classified. <clears throat> I did. I, I mean, I saw you on some board somewhere. I saw wherever you guys had hosted the Sea Doom page. Like I mm-hmm. found it. You know, mm-hmm. and. Well, I think you guys had screenshots posted and some other stuff, and I was like, "That'll, that's more so, than good enough." So you, <clears throat> so you didn't even play it yet. I had, I had. Well, I think I had to become part of the team to get a downloadable version of it, or something like that, or maybe I didn't. But whatever it was, I, I, I was working a desk job at the time, and that's that's important because what you had to know about me back then is, you know, I've been a full time musician for a long time now, and only recently am I am I sort of doubling duties now. Um, you know, I, I have a, I have a different full-time job. Um, but at that time I worked in an office, which 
that shows you how long ago that was. I worked in an office, um, and I had a rig with me that I would bring to work. I had hmm. a little laptop that would pop on a desk because I got to be honest, at the job that I was at, there was a lot of downtime. There was nothing to do. So I would work on music. So wow. I actually did some of the work for that project at that job. And, um, but I had, and I would have to carry it home and then do more work on guitars and stuff, you know, but I, I definitely did. I think I did some of the animatic stuff like entirely without a keyboard. I just used it because Ableton lets you use the actual keyboard keyboard yeah. on the computer. Yeah. And I used that to make some of those animatic, uh, melodies and stuff. Wow. So I don't remember the original question because, but the coffee's kicking in now. So I'm ready. Just yes. ask another one. <laughs> <clears throat> That okay. wad of methamphetamine that I dropped in the in the first one is I'm I'm ready to go now. Yeah, ready to go. Um, okay, yeah. So I've just always been curious about that, and that I I feel like I should have a notepad because as people are talking, I'm I'm thinking of questions, and by the time they finish their answer, I forget, and I don't want to interrupt in the middle of their conversation. The no, just go ahead and interrupt. That's that's the mode of speak uh, that you have to just stop. I'm me, supposed to be interviewing. Just, I'm the interviewer. So every time I let my face turns really white is because i'm i'm looking at uh you put your screen questions. on so you can see the questions yeah mm -hmm. i should find a way to get dark mode on word i don't think there is a way is there no is i don't think so mode? um and there never will be talk about how you approached remaking e1 m9 the first thing i had to do was listen to it because i didn't have obviously the levels memorized by music other than e1 m1 everybody knows how that one starts but I didn't really know which one. So I, I went and found it. Um, I don't even know if I had a copy of Doom at the time, but I'm, I'm sure I was able to just find the MIDI somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as it played, I was like, oh, this is the secret base. This is, this is okay, I know this. So what I did is I listened to the whole track. And I, I think I took, I, I think I downloaded the MIDI for it. And I, I dropped it into Logic. And so I could see tempo. I could see where everything was supposed to go. And I don't think, I think, unfortunately, it didn't obey tempo. It was all over the place. Right. It was all so over. So I just had to analyze the parts. And like you said, it's, 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 a, it's a 12 bar blues. It's a, it's a, it's a one, four, five kind of track. And so that was easy enough. You know, I've got enough theory under my belt to know like any song could go like this, but I needed to separate the parts. Um, obviously that opening riff, when I heard it, down there, it's in fifths. And it sounds geeky and silly in MIDI, yeah, but I was totally. like, he's doing power chords, right? So I thought, like, I'm just going to tune the guitar to a power chord and tune it down a little bit, which I do on my Gibson all the time. I think I'm tuned down to C, uh, mm, and nice. just the top three strings are just, all I've got to do is bar it, jang, 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 jang. Like, a lot of guys do that, right? So, um, so I did that on this, but I think at the time I didn't have a Gibson. Uh, I think I had like a, a Strat or something. It, it was not like a great metal guitar. Do you know what I mean? You did so that on a Strat? Tune, That's like... I th think so. Blasphemy. I, I didn't get the Gibson until a little bit later uh, when I went full time. So my, one of my first purchases was this like middle of the road Gibson that I have. Um, but so I did what I... I, could, I this is my musical theory with... Or I guess my my approach with everything is... Don't buy gear. First, do what you can with what you've got and, and yeah. realize you probably can get 97% of the way. And then instead of buying 10 plugins, buy that one that you need to do some limiting at the end or to do some, you're just not getting the guitar sound you want. So you, you buy a pedal or something like that, but you realize you have so much available to you. So I did that with the, with the E1M9. And then what was interesting is I listened to the drums that were in, in E1M9 and I was like, there are certain parts in this that sound like a mosh part. You know, like the and I was like, that's got to be like a that's that that's going to bring out a nice change of feel in the song because having a tempo change in the middle of it or really just a time change in it is is moving away from that MIDI sound, you know, where everything is just you know, he actually did some pretty cool drum work in it, too. But I was like, if this was me, if this was a band and I had to play it live and I wanted to see like sneakers in the air and kids flying and all the kind of stuff I saw when I was in, when, I, when I was in a punk band, this would need to have tempo changes in it. Because in New York City, New York City hardcore scene, oh yeah, it was the slow parts that made yes, people the break go crazy. Which is exactly which is funny because yep. what I heard was that on the West Coast, the kids do that during the fast parts, and and so it's reversed. Weirdos. Yeah, weirdos. What's wrong with the West Coast? But you know, 
that's 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 what I thought for that song. And then I also thought, um, I'm not stealing from it, Gordon. This was my thought back then. But that what was lacking in a purely metal soundtrack um, is the fact that this happens in a technological environment. I mean, you know, you can't go to Mars without you can't go to Mars or, organically. So you're in a space station or you're in a, a giant facility. And so I started adding some of these cool little blippy synths and stuff like that because I really wanted to nod to the fact that Doom was always a, a space game. You know, and it was always a, a, a like a you're always in these technological environments, uh, and even when you're not, even when you're in some some weird sort of hellish environment, it's technology that brought you there. So there actually was a thought process to every instrument that's added, and that's usually I usually try to. And I don't want to sound like you know it probably sounds pretentious, but I really do like to think about why am I putting this instrument in here? Like you know, I know why I'm going to put guitars, drum, and bass in here is because it needs to rock. But everything else needs to have a reason to be here. Otherwise, it gets caught. Yeah, I mean, cut. You know, it gets completely cut from it because it's just taking up space or it's me just adding something that I want to hear in there, but it doesn't serve the purpose of the game. Um, and then I think the other thing was to ask you, like, how long does it need to be? Like, because but back then we had a RAM budget. You know what I mean? Like, it was like, not a RAM budget, but you know what I mean? Like, you can't make these things so big. And I, I yeah. forget if you finally used OGG or, or what, or MP3 or whatever it was, but I couldn't put an eight-minute mix in there. You know what I mean? So right, had to be something that could kind of loop and, and, and yep. do its job. But that, that's how I approached it. And then I did I did it in Logic okay. know, back then. In fact, I don't even think I used the, the, this is a shame to me because I, I use a real amp. But I didn't have one mic'd up back then. I didn't have I didn't purchase one that fit in my new home or any of this other stuff. So I used virtual sounding like amps for that. I played the guitar for real, but I went through yeah. some crap, you know, logic thing back then. Wow. That's, that was real early days of virtual amps. <clears throat> real early. And I will say they were on the cutting edge of it. They, they it did yeah. sound passable. There were the, it was the first one that came out that I was like, okay, I could work with that. That sounds all right. It's not well, it sounded, you know, an amp. It sounded better than the guitars. I was like, when you sent me that mix, I was like, oh my God. He just that was just your me. mixing skills at the time. You you were you were recording all good stuff. You just uh, you had taken all that time to learn music, and suddenly it was like also you have to be an engineer. So go just yeah. just like Doom. Like, I mean, go. Not it, easy. Yeah, like I want. I've always seen myself as a musician first, and I needed to learn to be a producer to get my stuff out there because I'm not going to go to a studio every time I have a song idea. Right, and so initially. I don't think I really called myself a producer. Um, I was just a musician trying to record music. Man, if the shoe fits, you were you you by you know nature of having to be one, you were a producer. You know? And that that actually kind of that brings me to the what we were talking about initially with the Dawes with uh, mm -hmm. using Cakewalk, and you've kind of bounced around a little bit. For me, the number one impediment to me getting my ideas into reality is if I'm frustrated with the, the technology and the fact that I can just jump into cakewalk and I know exactly how to do everything in there. Yep. It just, it just, it, it streamlines getting my ideas from my brain into the computer. And That's exactly there might, right. There might be better DAWs out there, but if I were to switch, I would be, the learning curve would just frustrate me and I wouldn't be able to get my ideas out. And that's all I want to do. I just want to record my ideas. Cause like I'll be in the shower I'm like, Oh my God, I've got this crazy idea. I have to remember this and I'll get out and I'll play it on my guitar. And that's the first step. Like, can I right. play it? And is it going to sound like it sounds in my head? Yep. And then it's the next like picking step picking a kitchen knife. Yeah. That what's yeah. the, what's the best kitchen knife or what's the best gun? It's the one that feels right in your hand. You know, yeah. it's not, it, I don't like pro tools. I know I've worked with guys in Nashville for years. Uh, I worked on a lot of, uh, <laughs> so funny, we're talking about Doom. I worked on a ton of Christian records, you know, for these guys. Right. They all use Pro Tools. Okay. Mick Gordon uses Pro Tools, Fruity Loops, and Ableton. <clears throat> I can't work in Pro Tools. It doesn't It doesn't have the mindset that works for me. But I would never tell you Pro Tools is, is bad software. It, it, right. It's king of the hill in many ways. But you used Cakewalk because it just feels right. And mm -hmm. it, you, it's the shortest amount of time to having the idea between having the idea and executing the idea. That's the right thought for you. Right. You know, and that's if I really wanted, I, I could always take my tracks and put them in another piece of software if I really <laughs> needed. 
you know, sure. but I, I don't, I've, I've figured out how, how to get by. So well, yeah, when I anyway. didn't know Ableton that well, I was taking stuff I was doing in Ableton and I was mixing and mastering in logic because I knew logic so well. Sure. But over time, I eventually just figured out how to do it in Ableton. So I, I cut the, the development time of, of each song down, you know, but yeah, you can, you can, you can use different DAWs for different purposes. So I was actually, uh, my second to last interview was with, um, one of my other musician friends, uh, uh, Cameron, um, Bashaw and you and he are like my two, you know, got the East coast and West coast guys. Cause he's in California. <laughs> Uh, ask him about the mosh parts uh, in California. Yeah, I'll have to ask him about that. Uh, do you have a breakdown in California? How does that work? <laughs> but he was talking about, um, he's also a very skilled producer. And um, he was talking about how when he's done with every song, he he like, because, you know, we were talking about you can never resurrect a song like two years from now. Your com- your rig is going to be totally different. You're going to forget that you had this plug in, and you're going to open it, and it's not going to work. Oh, yeah. So a- after every song, after every every project, he'll print it, uh, print each track, uh, mix smart. down like yeah, export every stem, so that if he needs to open it later, he can at least have all the multi track multi track stuff. Right. I've never done that. Like when I'm done, I had to do that. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure you have. You're professionally. You've never things. you've never done it. You just you just you you've had the never. baby, <clears throat> sent it to college. Yeah, when I've, I mix it down and I'm happy with it, that I'm done. If I if I had all my my tracks from all my songs, I would revisit them constantly. But there's, it's probably good for you then. There's a finality to just saying I'm done. Because yeah. like my number one song on Spotify, Quad Machine. There's stuff in there like. My guitars got off, off, uh, off beat a little bit, right? And my drums were quantized, and so it, like every time I listen to it, I'm like, God, I should have fixed that. I should have. And if I could, yeah. I I would go back and revisit it, and I'd be like, Oh, here's my five five years after the fact. Here's my remaster. Now listen. And to nobody this one. who likes that song would care. Nope. They already like it, and if you yeah. change it, they may not even notice what the improvement is. Uh, or worse, they may not appreciate it. Yeah. Well, another thing that I've, I've tried to, uh, do <clears throat> recently is not quantize everything perfectly. Like if right, I play right. drums on, if I, you know, I play the drums on my keyboard and for the most part, I suck at it. And there's a reason I quantize because you would not want to hear it right. raw from my keyboard. So I have to quantize, but there's some times where I, I do a fill on the keyboard and I'm like, how the hell did I do it? Like it I'll practice off. it. I'll practice it for five minutes and then I'll hit record and I'll just do it. And yeah. initially I was like, okay, now I have to zoom in and get all the things perfect. And I've learned, let it, just let it go. Let it be. Sometimes it's okay. Absolutely. To have it. it sounds natural. There's beauty in it. I agree. I saw, I saw Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters talking about why he brings people up on stage. Oh, and sometimes yeah. it's a hit and sometimes it's a miss. And he says, cause I love that. It's real. <clears throat> I don't want it to be perfect. I don't want it. I, I just want it to be music. And, you know, the more we, we, we use, this is something I've, I've talked about even on, on my own podcast at times, which I, I should pick that up again one day, but um, <clears throat> you can't let your DAW, you can't let your program dictate the music that you're making. And it's hard, it's hard to stop it because it offers you ways of doing things, but then the musical ways that you learned to think in, start to adapt to the technology, which is fine to a degree, but you cannot give autonomy up to the DAW. I see so many of these ads come at me now that say like, get this MIDI pack. <clears throat> oh yeah. I've I, never I would once. I would rather have a colonoscopy than use someone else's music. It's yep. one thing to cover it and acknowledge that's who it is. But someone's saying, you need a melody, bro. I got you. Like, I get this ad all the time for some guy. I'm like, no, I make the melody dingle bot. You know, yeah. I mean, it's that's ridiculous. Yeah, I see, and that is the just, same, I see the same thing for drums. Like, drum right. drum MIDI. Like, why the hell would I use your MIDI? I'll make it my, myself. Exactly. I'm just buying a drum kit I don't have to mic, but I want to hear my own drums. And, and unfortunately, with so many of these DAWs that are out now, they offer you the ability to hit a button and the music starts coming out. And I'll tell you straight up right now. And, and I, and I think, um, uh, 
what's his face? Dead Mouse said this too on his master class. It's like, look, all the all the record labels, all the people who might put you out there, they know what those presets sound like because they get a million demos all the time from people and all they're doing is hitting that that preset in there and going, oh, that's my music. That's not your music. Tweak mm-hmm. it, change it, put it through some distortion at the very least. Put do something. Yeah. Or make your own presets. And I think that is probably why I like what you did with the M1, of the fact that you were playing around drums. You were like, he's literally just trying to have a recording studio so he can execute his ideas. And he's not a slave anymore to, you know, whatever the, uh, you know, whatever the, the DAW is telling him to do. Um, yeah. And, and actually to that, to the point you were making, I, I actually learned on a uh, Foscam 4 track. A Fostex? A Fostex? It was not Foscam? Yeah. Whatever it is. There the 4-track. Oh, it was a Foscam? I don't know. I thought it was a Fostex 4-track. I'm going to have to look that up. But yeah, it was a 4-track, tra- <clears throat> and it was it was literally, you know, cassette tape. Yeah, that same here. You'd put in there. And it was a quarter-inch tape, so, you know, the sound quality was <laughs> crap. Oh, yeah. But that's how I it's learned. It's eighth-inch. Eighth-inch? Was that if only eighth If it's a eighth-inch? cassette, using cassettes... That's oh, what because, I used to, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it was amazing that, I mean, the bleed through on those things was incredible. In fact, sometimes it made some cool artifacts. I had a Yamaha. Yeah. That's what my guitar teacher made me get. And you're talking about, it cuts it into four lanes. Yeah. And, and so the bleed through on it is, is, is pretty constant. But, um, and a lot of my recordings, it's going to, this is going to be funny. Grow up in New York city, right? I had a Marshall amp that I did have mic'd and I used it all the time. But we had a lot of cab drivers in the area, and somehow that amp was not impervious to the radios that they used. So I have, like, people speaking in Spanish on some of my old recordings oh, wow. from those cabs coming through the distortion. And I got to admit, speaking of little happy accidents, that stuff I would never take off of those recordings if I could find them yeah. anywhere. Because, you know, that, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, sounding. that's awesome. Yeah. So you, you didn't build, like, a Faraday cage around your apartment? No, my mom would have not been down with that. Not one bit. <laughs> she was, it was five flights up. I was surprised that we'd still get the signals, but you know, your yeah. picture came back by the way. Oh, there cool. There you are. Yay. Um, yeah. So like, there's a reason um, I've never used, like people talk about templates. Mm. I've never used a template. I just, yeah. I start a project and I add each track as I need it. Right. I mean, call me crazy, but I, I just want my project to reflect the song. Like right. if I have a new song, all right, I need left guitar, right guitar, maybe a middle, lead guitar, right, drums, bass. <clears throat> so oh, I need keyboard. Yeah, I'll just add a new track. Right. Whatever. Right. I've got I've got um, presets in my plugins, but I don't have like a template tr- project that I open up and here's my metal song. Absolutely. Here's my uh, orchestral song. I don't know. I save my own presets i have a lot i'm gonna have like yards and yards of of custom presets that i build for sounds but i even usually tweak those when i'm done and if i ever did use a template it's one that i made like we i've done this thing where i've I've gotten a song into a trailer right uh and so i think to myself all right editors like that one um so i'm gonna save it under a new name delete all my stuff delete all the stuff and just reuse these instruments to make something new just to see what happens and every now and then you you get a gem, but I still wind up adding and changing a whole bunch of stuff because just like you, I'm like that's not what this, this song's not going in that direction. I don't need those yeah. ticky drums or whatever it is. Yeah, you know. But uh, it's funny that you say too that there's a finality to finishing um, <clears throat> a song. I often have to make stems. Yeah, because the way editors work when they take your stuff for what a trailer, TV show, whatever it is you're working on. These days, they would like to have the stems. They'd like to say, well, I want to cut the drums here. I don't want to have to call the composer and have them do a custom and then have them still not make it. Because that's what happens, by the way. They put you through all this extra work, and then the studio still doesn't like it, and they go with another editor. So to cut that down, it's just kind of understood that if I'm giving you a song mm-hmm. uh, and you're at some L.A. editing house, you, I have the stems already ready to go. You yep. know, and that way, when you ask me for them, after you've tempted in the track, you know, I'll just be able to throw you the stems if you're really getting serious about it. And that's usually when we know an editor is getting pretty serious is when they ask for the stems, you know, and they assume that we have them on tap. And I often don't, but I just make them right there, you mm-hmm. know, real quick. I have a I have a pretty quick method for doing that. But we don't get that finality 
in that yeah, in, right. the, in the music for picture <clears throat> business. So, um, with games, AAA games these days, there's there's a system. I think it's called Wise, W I S E, W W I S E. Okay, yeah, and it's similar to that. They they don't put the full mix in there because the as the the game, you know, you're traveling through the level. And like, here's a boss fight, so the guitars have to come up more, and then the guitar, right. or the drums will drop out, whatever. Like they, they almost like mix in the games. I don't. Yeah, it's a dynamic know a mixing system. It. It's very cool. Yeah, that is cool. Um, I've been thinking of learning that system. Yeah, I. All of the lessons are free. You can get I'm certified sure in it without paying a dime. I want to check out that. <clears throat> um, uh, Dead Mouse Masterclass. I also want to watch the Hans Zimmer Masterclass. I watched some of it. Do the Dead Mouse one. I learned more. Okay. And I love orchestral stuff, and I think Hans Zimmer is amazing. But yeah. I got more out of uh, Dead Mouse. Also, he's funny because he's very okay. dry. Oh, I love. Yeah, I love that shit. I love he's dry, and then he says weird stuff. But <clears throat> for the kind of music you and I produce, um, I think I got more out of his class than. Uh, you know, I did out of Hans Zimmer's. You know, like five years ago, I was really trying to move past just doing metal all the time. Like I was trying to uh, learn more synth stuff. And right. it's really like fish out of water for me. <laughs> I have a really hard time with it because I didn't grow up on it. And right. like I know there's um, Andrew Hullshelf however you pronounce his last name he he was he he's traveled a similar path to me except he's had a hundred percent more success he started by <laughs> remaking the doom songs mm -hmm. and they're different than mine you know mine right. definitely feel more raw his feel more produced more polished um and his videos on youtube for those have millions of streams right um <clears throat> but he ended up moving from one project to the next, to the next, to the next, to the point where he's working with it. It's software now. And when Mick Gordon was let go, he stepped in, you know, like here's this guy who 10, 15 years ago or whatever was doing the same thing that I, I did to start out. And now he's working with it software. Um, yeah. But he, he had to, he had to expand past his metal roots. Like he, just yeah. like me. Um, and to the point where he's doing modular stuff, like he puts, videos on facebook where he's he literally he's got, got modular system modular yeah. synths like with all the little wires going oh, like, holy crap yeah mick gordon actually did do some of that but no they're 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 everyone i know who's got a modular doesn't understand that i have children and can't spend money on a modular system <laughs> oh and they're God. like why don't you have a modular system yet brian and i'm like it's because i'm paying for college right now is why I, and i know <laughs> that, uh, that that would be like opening a bag of crack like i mean oh wow i oh, can yeah. just keep expanding this <clears throat> so my, my self-discipline says don't get that. But it's really interesting that you bring up like stretching outside your zone. I think a lot of it, a lot of our ability to do that has to do with our intake more than our, our output. So one of the first records I got when I was a kid, because I wanted to run around to it and, and be in, we, you know, we, we didn't have streaming and we didn't have a videotape uh, in the 70s. And even when, when a movie came out on video in the 80s, it was like years before it happened. So to to enjoy Star Wars, I had to get the soundtrack. If I was gonna if I was gonna relive Star Wars without going to the movie theater, I had to have a friend over and we had to get flashlights and we had to have a lightsaber duel while playing the soundtrack. Yeah. And so I listened to John Williams' soundtrack for Superman, for um, Star Wars, eventually even for Indiana Jones. Um, just non stop. And all the while I had my mother playing me the Beatles, you know, we had a double record set of the, that, that anthology, the Beatles stuff. Um, I had get this. I had, I think the, the soundtrack to Annie, you know, <laughs> it's a hard knock life. Yeah. I listened to, I listened to whatever was available to me that right. You know, yeah. I had a Billy Joel, uh, 45 and I had like, I think I had disco Mickey mouse, which by the way is very good. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm listening to all this stuff and I never put it away. Even when I was a teenager, if I heard, I you wanted to keep listening to it, and I, I want, I, and I, I gained new music, but I didn't necessarily graduate out of my old music. So when it finally came time, and I started doing um, trailers, 
uh, and doing music for, you know, getting into orchestral, I had to call on all that orchestral music that I had listened to because when I first started trying to make it, I was like, it doesn't sound like that at all. It sounds like a, like a punk rocker trying, <laughs> yeah. to, trying to do something here. But I had enough musical training to say, all right, where am I missing it? What's going wrong? And I actually, I bought books uh, and I started looking nice. up like how orchestras are placed. And I, and I had to figure out like, well, your violas sound ridiculous or your <clears throat> cellos sound ridiculous because you're not using them in their sweet range. So for me, it took a decade of, of just... You know, trying to apply uh, traditional music like trad harm and and some classical harmony, and then what I had listened to. That was the lion's share of it was how much of that John Williams I had already shoved into my head and enjoyed, and that's yeah. what really transitioned me into making into into getting outside the comfort zone and being able to even combine it, like you know, with other musics. Like we, I, I think for Methodic, I've done some stuff where we we do classical music, like we'll do Beethoven's Fifth, but we'll put a hip hop beat to it. But to me, it's still got to it's still got to come off legit. It can't sound, you know, it can't sound like someone who doesn't know what they're doing with orchestra. Yeah. So I feel and you. Actually, to that point, I I have an easier time with orchestral stuff than I do with synths because I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't, I don't think I rode the new wave, or the the retro wave, or whatever in the eighties. I, I wasn't into that stuff. Like in the eighties, I was listening to Chicago, you know, and <laughs> that's great stuff though. All that horn and work, Boston. Yep. And like I was listening to rock and roll and right. I, <clears throat> I didn't actually get into that new wave stuff until 20 years after it was already gone. Oh, and not that you. I've ever, I've never really loved it. <clears throat> I, I don't care for a lot of it. Um, right. You know, give me some Chicago any day. Um, <laughs> but I, I definitely. I rode the new wave. Okay. I'm sure you did. Uh, Do you want to know why? Sure. Girls liked New Wave. Oh, yeah, okay. And I had zero prospects, so I had to, <laughs> I had to find any way to be in the presence of women, no matter what it was. And when it came down to, oh, I like this band, I was like, I love Tears for Fears. They're the greatest thing that ever happened. You know, and then I could have a, a one minute conversation with a woman before being rejected. So, uh, New Wave, <laughs> and then I grew to love it on my own. So, yeah, I did like Tears for Fears. Yep. But the only the only real song that I the only song I think I really knew very well of theirs was the Everybody Wants to Rule the World or whatever. That's a great song. It's one and, of the brightest, most. Po it's it's because it was at the end of Real Genius. Oh yeah, with Val Kilmer. Yeah, and I watched that movie on repeat when I was a yeah. uh, uh, not a teenager, a kid in the eighties when we got it on on like we taped it off HBO or something. We watch yeah. it all the time. There's like no more nerdy movie from and total tangent. But the reason I love that movie, even to today, is because especially for the eighties, there was no better movie that respected nerds than yeah. that movie. Certainly and wasn't like, Revenge of the Nerds. No, Revenge of the Nerds was awful. And there was like <laughs> weird science. No, that's awful. And, and every Every time nerds showed up in a movie or a television show like Saved by the Bell, they right. were they were the under people, you know, they were under the cool kids. Yeah. But in Real Genius, the smarter you were, the cooler you were. I thought that right. was awesome. And then they played with lasers? Yeah. Oh. You realize I that's like that. the seed the seed of nerds taking over the world which they, you know, they have and um Oh, absolutely. You know. And they're just as tyrannical as, as the jocks were. So what have <laughs> yeah. we learned? Yeah. Elon Musk is trying to buy Twitter. Jesus I know. J J jocks will knock you in the dirt and nerds will take all of your private data. So, yeah, right. uh, <laughs> yeah, good. so really the key to it is just lock in and play some doom, you know? Yeah. So Chase yeah, the blues um, away. I have to see if there's <laughs> any, so obviously you've had, you've had, I, I did have a question on here. Like, have you had big projects since C doom? Obviously you, you've, You've made some stuff. Is there any, um, are there any trailers or TV shows or anything that you're able to tell people that you did that they could go sure. watch? I mean, I think, I think I just got one for, of all things, it's the Chippendales movie on <laughs> Disney. I think I have a retrowave piece in the trailer for that that's not out yet, but that'll come out. But I just got notification about that like a couple weeks ago. Um, I had uh, I have had stuff on Showtime. 
I had a lot of HBO stuff when Game of Thrones was out for the promos. Like this is always for I, I don't get into the shows. I get into the mm. promos and the trailers. Okay. I've done. Um, I mean, even going all the way back to when the first Avengers movie came out, you know, my friend Kendall and I did a track for MDM. Uh, he started it and I finished it off and it made it into the the Super Bowl Thanksgiving Day trailer for the Avengers. The first time everybody saw that cool shot where it circles around them and they're all ready to fight in New York City. Yeah. Uh, X-Men. Um, I think I got one Captain America in there. I mean, the list is like hundreds and hundreds of, of trailers when I yeah. – because I, I, I even don't know when they're coming out sometimes. I find out when they come out. Uh, they're much more secretive about it, but once it's out, um, I can do it. But I will point to one trailer that I'm, I'm particularly proud of because I got the entire trailer, and that r- seldom happens. Usually you're, you're just part of one act in the trailer, you know? Uh, and the first one that I got the full thing was, was a song I made also with Kendall. Kendall's a great writer. Kendall Barwick uh, is a writer in L.A., and a, like a brother to me. And um, he and I got the X-Men first class trailer, the whole thing. So if you watch that trailer and you hear that rock track in there with some hip hop in it, the hip hop is Kendall, the rock is me. Um, and we got the whole thing. But recently a track I did on my own got uh, a movie came out a couple years ago called the lighthouse with, um, Oh yeah. Yeah. The whole trailer oh. is, is just a, a What's the name of the guy from did. Robert Pattinson's in it and Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe. That's right. Yeah. And I haven't seen the movie yet because Me neither. I kind of have to, you know, I have to pick and choose what I'm going to watch with the family. And that movie didn't look like it was. Uh, oh, it looks it was very dark. Subtly. Yeah. yeah. But so, I hear so it's darkly funny. So how much of it did you do? Whole thing. You and, did, oh, um, my God. Okay. I have. Yeah. To, and, and are you credited as Brian Gosher? You don't get credit for trailers. You get a check. And that, that does fine. Oh, yeah. You know, I'll take a check. Yeah, I'll take a check. That's the you're, if you want to see your name printed somewhere. On the check. That's where So it is it like if someone were to YouTube uh, official trailer for the light? Yep. What was it called? The Lighthouse? Lighthouse. Yeah, The Lighthouse. The lighthouse. Um, lighthouse. You, they, they'd be hearing your music. Yeah, and it's mostly just like piano noises, like like pounding on a piano and just weird ticks and things like that. Really unsettling. Uh, yeah, it's a piece that probably took me, I'm going to be honest, maybe like two hours to do or something like wow. that. I would crank a bunch of them out in a row. And you don't know which one's going to go because they all em- evoke some kind of emotional response. But I can't predict which editor is going to have a response. to. So you have to have several. And you sort of throw them sure. out like seeds. And and I really yep. credit Methodic Doubt Music. It's uh, it's uh, my buddy Dane who who's over there who gets the stuff placed. Um, and he's very smart about how he sends stuff out. Like Because editors will ask for stuff. They'll, they'll send out a we're looking for kind of notice. And I know they get back a lot of stuff that's totally off target because they they send to people who hey, they just throw whatever they have at it. And Dane doesn't do that. Dane sits there and he's very, very – it's funny. Methodic Doubt is the name of his company. That's the reason we've had success is because they're careful with the music. You know, um, If there's any other projects to really highlight, um, you know, it's one thing. You know, Millions and millions of people hear your music when it's in a trailer. But they don't know it's you. Yeah. So a long time ago, I gave up the idea that I, I would need people to know that it's me. I'm just happy to see. Wow. Like, all right, here, here's a good one. My kids were sitting on the couch when Thor The Dark World was coming out. And they were little. They were in their pajamas. They were, like, ready to go to bed. And we were just, I don't know, having popcorn on the couch or something like that. And the music for um, Thor The Dark World, the commercial comes on the television. And I'm like, God, this is familiar. What is this? And it hit me. I was like, I did this music. And the kids, you know, they jumped all over me. They're like, "Yay!" They didn't even they weren't even <laughs> watching Marvel movies back then. They were just so excited. Um, but where I do get credit is when I do a game. And uh, so, like Slice of Sea was a game that I just did the sound for. So it's, you know, it's a, it's an independent game. It's by Matt Scottnick. Um, and all the submachine games that I did with him, people have posted the music for that. Thousands of views. I should have posted it long ago. I should have taken control of that, but. Really, in the end, I'm kind of glad that, that so many people liked it. I don't know why. Yeah. It's creepy music, but I appreciate the love. You know? Yeah. I actually have I, – I was just telling someone recently that um, I didn't jump on posting my music for the Classic Tune 3 soundtrack on YouTube. So I didn't – like, I was at the time, like, why would someone go to YouTube to listen to music? Like, that's right. Like, <laughs> exactly. Like, it's for videos. Exactly. And, and – yeah. um, but as a consequence, other people did. 
and they have hundreds of thousands of streams on theirs. And I finally posted them like five years ago. Right. And I have like 500 listens to E1M3 or something like that. It's ridiculously small. Right, right, right. So the music so. for the Lighthouse trailer, uh, is that just something you had in your... Well, I was like doing an album a, of them. Oh. When, when we... The trailer guys that I work with, um, we make albums in certain styles. Al- albums are dictated by styles. So you might have an album that's just dedicated to ticking. And you have these pieces that, you know, increase in tempo or... Because, t- you know, it... Feelings. Editors are constantly looking for that stuff or just washy pads or giant epic orchestral, um, wh- whatever it is that, you know, is, is a genre that's frequently requested. We'll do different albums in those styles. And sometimes we'll innovate and try and get editors turned on to a, a thing that we're thinking of. And sometimes it takes, sometimes it doesn't. Um, the lighthouse was, was essentially natural sounds collected into unsettling kind of eerie pieces. Yeah, which believe it or not, that's that's one of the most winning things for me. Cause I, I, I turned out to be one of the things that I'm good at, you know, just to make these very unsettling sort of pieces, and you know, like I, I, which is weird because I'm very like you could ask my family, like I'm I'm always happy. I don't <laughs> I don't have like some dark brooding inside. I just get how to do those tracks. But, that's you know, cool. Like, they don't catch me sitting there thinking about murder or something like that. You know, I'm yeah. usually like thinking about coffee. If I if I ever try to do something like that, inevitably I just end up making something melodic and pretty. I just have a hard time with that. It's your training. It's what it's it. It takes years to untrain it, yeah. and and then add it back to what you normally do. And uh, I mean, it can be well, worth it, but I sometimes not. Do have to get going. You got any more questions? No, I don't think I do. Um, if I if I think of something, I'll hit you up, and maybe we'll do like a a quick thing. But I think um, this has been an awesome conversation. I think it's fun. We should we should have had a conversation like this a long time ago. Yeah, but uh, and and not necessarily in the context of C Doom. Um, but <laughs> I think there are a lot of people who uh, love the mod that will appreciate hearing your perspective on it. Uh-huh. So, oh, I'm totally gonna play it again. By the way, you know. yeah. If you I'm have trouble gonna... getting it loaded, let me know. I can help. I will. Because I, I just absolutely did it. will. Oh, you were able to do it? Yep. And we're both on PCs, so you'll, your instructions yeah. will. It was so hard to get it playing on a Mac. Oh, but God. I did get it back because I did the whole thing on a Mac. <laughs> yeah. If you uh, if you buy the game on Steam, which is only like $5 and less than you get it on sale. Okay. From Steam? Yeah, from Steam. Okay. Yeah, you can, like, right, I forget where it is, but you can, like, right click and view the key, the CD key. Mm-hmm. And you need that key to play the mod. Gotcha. It, like when you load the mod, it just says enter your CD key. It's just like a hard code thing in the game. Right. That's so the hardest part. Make, to make sure people weren't sending out the whole game with the mod. Probably. Apparently. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, dude. Um, All right, man. It was awesome talking. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna stop recording. Talk right, to boss. you later. Later. Bye.